Seaweed, we've heard a lot about that today. Seaweed sun defence uh, is what Tom Wheeler from Cawthron uh, is here uh, to talk about uh, with us today. Tom is a molecular physiologist by training, currently investigating algal composition and health benefits. He is the head of the research and method development team within the analytical science at Cawthron Institute. He has over 20 years experience of research expertise and specialises in pulling together multidisciplinary teams of researchers. Tom, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, no Ingarangi, no Ariana, no uh, Hamane, no Ateria Okutupuna, uh, I, I whana mai au i um, awakarangi a Whanganui Atara, i tipu aki a hau i Wainui Amata, um, no uh, whakatū au i noho ana, uh, kei kairanga hau a hau i uh, kia Cawthron Institute, ko Tom Wheeler, toko ingawa. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about a project that I've been peripherally involved in, and that really is um, conceived and implemented by my colleague at Cawthron Institute, Mike Packer. I'm not Mike Packer, but hopefully I can do his vision and its implement implementation some justice. Um, it's a largish team. Um, let's see how we go. The clock's ticking. So, as a sort of uh, somebody who's been a researcher in mammalian biology for many years, I'm kind of amazed um, when I'm working, find myself working in macroalgae um, or seaweed, some of the earliest evolving organisms on the planet in a fascinating, very different biology um, compared to what I'm used to. And I think with a lot of um, unappreciated potential and um, um, uh, weird and fascinating things. Um, there's all sorts of things. I work on proteins in um, particular kind of macroalgae um, karinga, which I'll briefly allude to later. There's all sorts of lipids, polysaccharides, and second metabolites that have a lot of potential for producing health benefits and, <coughs> and so forth. I'm going to talk about just one or two particular um, uh, components of the secondary metabolites. Um, the microsporin-like amino acids and fluorotannins as the, and evaluating the potential in certain seaweeds as an ingredient for next generation sunscreens, so kind of a high value product concept. Okay. So what's the problem that this is addressing? We have sunscreens, right? And they work, they do. But some people are worried. Um, they, there's um, a thought out there that they're toxic to the environment. Um, I don't know how true that is, but that concern is there. Um, uh, they also have, might have concerns to the user in terms of health concerns. Uh, there's a lot of very unnatural looking chemistry that's, oops, that's involved in, um, in some of these um, formulations. So can we get to something that's more, that's effective or even more effective than current um, formulations and is more natural? So that's really what this vision of this project's about. Um, so, what are these microsporin-like amino acids? There's, there's a couple of them there, the small molecules. They, what they do is they absorb UV light and dissipate it as heat, okay? And so they um, stop those bad effects of those UV rays getting onto the skin and doing damage. Fluorotannins are a type of um, polyphenol that um, are thought to, or have this evidence that they interact with mammalian biology, for instance, in, in the immune system, and the inflammatory system and have ben potential benefits. So you combine these two compo these attributes of um, seaweeds, um, that's the thought that could have some really high value perhaps. Okay. So the approach the team has taken uh, is summarized in this slide here. Um, and it's really to understand what's growing naturally but unappreciated on current aquaculture infrastructure and understand the diversity of what's there and what its potential in terms of those two active, potential active ingredients are. So the team surveyed a number of different mussel farms in the Marlborough Sounds um, over various seasons um, and different parts of the farm to get a, get a sort of a snapshot of what's there in terms of biodiversity, in terms of species and chemistry. Um, okay. 
I'm just going to give you a little snapshot in the short amount of time I've got um, that runs through some of the results. Okay, first of all, this is this slide here. It's a bit busy, but it does show, um, summarise all of the what, we, the what the findings are regarding the species diversity, the biological diversity that's present on muscle lines, and it's quite a lot. Um, so there's quite a bit of variation in the, um, in the, in the, in the weight of seaweeds um, per unit length of muscle line, um, and quite a bit of variability as well. So that's, that is actually of interest when you're considering this as a potential source of a, a raw material for producing an active ingredient. So you don't really want a lot of diversity and unpredictability around it, so that's kind of interesting. There are a lot of different species, so there's a lot of potential and interesting biology there. Um, the, this is really a snapshot of what the most abundant species are, and there's really no surprises there in terms of what's already known before, but the take-home message is it's very diverse and it's very dynamic. Okay. So what about the chemistry? So again, similar story, diverse and dynamic. So these are all the species lined up here in terms of the amount of, amino, of uh, microsporin-like amino acids they contain. You can see a lot of, a lot of variation, um, uh, some high, some low. Um, this is arranged according to depth in the water column. Um, I can overlay this, which I will, with um, seasonality. Um, there's no particular, I should say, with those two attributes, and the next one, with any um, particular, um, th th there's no correlation with, uh, with MAA levels with any of these attributes. Okay, so site, season, depth, it just seems to be a random um, assortment of amounts. What we can say, though, um, is that when we compared this with... Um, uh, with the levels we obtained with um, the, the, the kind of, um, another kind of seaweed that's not present in muscle lines, but I'm working with it, so I was very keen to make sure it was included, porphyra. Um, porphyra has a whole lot more than just about any other seaweed that was in that in muscle line. So if we're going to look for a source of MAAs, we would look in porphyra, which, of course, is known as cardinal in New Zealand. Okay. So bear that in mind. Taking that to flora, uh, so look, turning to fluorotannin levels now, a similar story, um, no correlation with any of those earlier parameters I measured, um, but there's one little difference, oh, so I should go backwards, one little difference is that um, these amounts here that we see in some of these species, they are the most abundant species, amongst the most abundant species found, so there's a reasonable amount of biomass and these levels are getting up there with as much as has been reported in any species internationally. So some of this material in the muscle lines is pretty good source of fluorotannins. Okay. So just to summarise what we found out, um, the, the, the MAAs are low and variable on muscle lines, but there is an abundant source of cardinal around the shorelines of New Zealand. It's just not on muscle lines. Um, uh, and fluorotannins are present on, uh, on the muscle lines in appreciable amounts. So what about a route to market? What do we, where do we go from here? I think this is, uh, I'm quite interested in, in this project because it kind of intersects with some work I'm doing on cardinal as well. And it turns out that we have been working on processing cardinal um, as, uh, initially, well, mainly as a source of protein, but as part of that work, we have also um, uh, investigated some science streams for the, for the abundance of microsporin-like amino acids and found the side stream here um, to be very, very high in it. So we've, I think, um, mapped out the beginnings of a route to market around cardinal, which, um, if we can produce it through aquaculture, because I don't believe in um, using wild harvest for commercial purposes, um, we might have a route to market. Okay. So that's really all I've got to say. Um, hopefully it covers everything that was done, um, except to acknowledge all the people involved. Um, Greg McPherson from SRW Labs um, was a key enabler of this project. Uh, the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, obviously. Uh, Andy Elliott um, from Fokker 2 Incorporated. 
and um, the guys from the Kono Seafoods who help with the um, getting us out to farms, and also Gary Fisher is a collaborator from the US. Thank you very much.